Uh, so our goal today is to talk about basic and advanced airways. Uh, you'll see credits for both of those because that's what we can find under the open protocols for put, putting in for credit for that. So that's done through our trauma department. So Corey put those in. So goals and objectives, we're going to talk about anatomy and assessment. I'll talk about innovation, ventilation. We'll touch on oxygenation and how that's different. For the lab, we're going to do a needle cricothyrotomy and a surgical cricothyrotomy. Uh, we're joined by three of our uh, ear, nose, and throat residents, Mark, who are our, our backup for the emergency department, and it's always a pleasure when they're with us at the same time when we're doing these procedures. Um, in, in a short 10-year career, I've had the opportunity to do three, so not very many. Um, in, in a career outside of the hospital, if you do one or two, that's a lot. So it's one of those procedures which I don't, I didn't take the, uh, I, I want to play the Captain Planet thing, but I can't do it again. <laughs> um, it's one of those opportunities for a heroic measure. Um, and if you do it well, the person might die. <clears throat> and if you do it poorly, the person will die. And so it's one of those scenarios where the reason we do these trainings is because it's not gonna come up in every year practice. And so it's something that we need to do from time to time to kind of refresh this and go, all right, well, if I need to do that, that looks amazing. Crap, how do I do that? And so this is a, a good walkthrough. This is my favorite lab to do with anybody because separate from taking three days to set up, it's fantastic. And I'm sorry for all of your noses in advance. So we'll talk about uh, the dissection and we'll discuss more on the lab side of things. So a couple of things that we talk about on this is obviously uh, when we're doing the plucks and we're working with pig plucks, it goes from tongue to diaphragm. So on our models today, we will have tongue, trachea, esophagus, lungs, heart, and diaphragm. None of the other stuff is there. There's no blades involved today as far as innovation blades because they don't have a face. So we're not using innovation blades. So when you're like, I'm missing tools, you're, you're not. You can use your fingers. Um, two of the opportunities that we're going to talk about on that is when you first learn to innovate, you get really excited and you're like, I'm going to drive it home. And you're going to put it all the way in and you will very adequately ventilate one of the lungs, uh, but maybe not the other one. So you can main stem these. Um, we'll do that on purpose for a couple to kind of show how that looks different, why it might sound different, why you might be not having the response you expected on your patient, uh, what kind of adjustments to make. Uh, we'll also grab some water and pour it down one of the a couple of the tubes after we get them hooked up so you can hear what coarse lung sounds are going to sound like. When you first bag these, they're an excellent example of a uh, chronic lung disease. So a person that has lungs that are fibrotic, scarred down, they're going to be really difficult to bag because they were deep frozen and they've been dead for four months. Mm -hmm. um, we'll get them to aerate back up and it actually comes up pretty well. It's just ridiculously rapid bagging to get them back up. And we'll get a kind of an idea of what does it feel like if you're bagging and it's really hard? Why is it really hard? Does it sound fine? Does it sound coarse? And you kind of think small airway versus large airway. Um, it helps dictate where are we going to go with this person? What do we think was going on? Because um, if we have a person that has a ton of fluid everywhere and they sound really wet, bronchodilators aren't going to do a whole lot for that individual. And so maybe we need to think CPAP on the way to the hospital as opposed to updrafts. Now we'll get to our airway. Um, this is still what our airway is going to look like on the plucks. Uh, tongue's going to be on the top side. If you're innovating and it's not on the top side, congratulations, you're making it more challenging. Um, but those scenarios exist. Uh, on our next slide, this is where we're actually going to take a lot of our focus. Um, the, the two white stripes in the middle, uh, obviously we want to leave those alone if we can, because otherwise they talk funny after we're done. Um, but that's, that's ideally your target, uh, is to get it between the vocal cords without banging into either one. Um, one of the tips and tricks that comes up with that is when you're going to put your tube in, the tubes have a bevel on them. So a lot of times you don't pay a whole lot of attention when you're queuing up your innovation supplies to which direction that's facing. If it's facing left or right, it's a lot easier to fit through that gap. If it's facing up and down, it will usually fit without too much trouble, but it's a real simple manipulation when you're holding the tube to just twist a little bit and watch it go, and go, oh, great. Um, and so just making that small, you know, 90 to 180 degree rotation and having it slide past 
that can be a lot of help. So for anatomy today, uh, this is the biggest part, and this is the participation portion of the lecture, the, the only other participations out there, so I appreciate that you're all fed and tired, but this will be the quick part. So we would like to make our access point at the cricothyroid ligament. We would really not like to do it at the thyrohyoid ligament because there are additional problems. So the plucks do have a hyoid bone on itself? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, they should. <laughs> Most of them should. Okay. Uh, they're set up on the blocks so that it would be difficult to get up to that position. Mm -hmm. um, but when we're doing anatomy on a person, and I know that no neck people exist because they always have tr airway troubles and come see me. Um, when you're trying to find this, it's easier to start from the bottom and move up than it is to try to start from the top and move down. Um, one of the first courses I ever uh, participated in the, with this, we the instruction was to feel from the top down, and I was like, "Shit, I keep ending up like two inches too high. I don't, I don't care for this." And so, feeling from the bottom up, the first lump you're going to feel is your cricoid cartilage, and then if you come right up over that and you start to push, and it feels like you would almost not choke, but it feels not good. That's where you want to be at for your cricothyroid ligament. Your thyroid cartilage is going to be immediately above that. And when we're doing our incisions today, our initial incision is going to be a vertical incision, not U3. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else want to tell me why it's a vertical incision? If not, we'll phone a friend. So, having the vasculature around the area. Okay, cool. Uh, what else happens when you make a horizontal incision? Let's say you're in the wrong, you're in the wrong spot geographically. You will feel yeah. yeah. So, so one, there's some relatively important arteries here, maybe. <laughs> but we really don't want to get that far off to the side. You've got to get a bit off to the side and a bit deep for that to be an issue. But you've committed to uh, height once you've done the horizontal incision. So, as as pointed out and as you mentioned, by doing a vertical incision, we avoid that vascular anatomy. And if we're a little high or a little low, we can extend our cut up or down to make a match for that. Uh, we make a horizontal cut through the actual cricothyroid ligament once we're there. And the most important thing on this is once you've located where you're making your cut, don't take your hand off it. Um, because it does. in a situation where you're doing this, the day hasn't gone well for you or the patient. This is not your first line therapy. Uh, your heart rate should be upwards of 150 if you know, you're in pretty good control of it. And um, the patient's already actively trying to die on you, so there's, you know, a little bit of pressure. Um, you want your hand to be there because once you've made your cut, in my experience, it's never a blood-free procedure. Um, and so if your hand comes off, you don't have as good of a grip. Um, I find that using a four by four for a grip, um, because it's that coarse material, gives you a lot better grip in a scenario of that than anything else. Uh, but making sure that you're stabilizing the structure once you're there. Um, as far as getting in, we'll actually talk about that on the lab portion. We'll start out by palpating landmarks. We'll do a needle crike, and we'll talk about how that can oxygenate, but does a very good job of ventilation because you're adding oxygen, but you're not allowing the exchange because you're not moving the volume there. Uh, you can still buy upwards of 20 minutes of time to get to where you're going to get a more definitive airway with doing that, and so there's significant value in it. Um, but until we can get it to them, we're not really going to ventilate well. Oh. The 3 3 2 rule, this has the second three and the, the two. Um, the first three is can they open their mouth large enough for you to fit three fingers stacked within? If they can't, or if their under jaw area is less than three, or if their area to our area palpation to, to thyroid cartilage is less than two, that patient has a pot potentially difficult airway. Um, you can tell what these are without doing any of those things when you look at them and their ears are sitting promptly on their shoulders. <laughs> um, the thing that you can't do externally very well is their male and potty score. And so if a person says hi and you can see everything, including their vocal cords, that's an easy airway. That's a one. Um, if they say hi, you can see some soft palate and a little bit of the back of their throat, you've got a two. When you get to a three, it's yeah, I, I can see the uvula, mm, kind of, sort of, not all of it. And then a, a four is always the person that I'm saying hi to. It's like, and they're not moving. Um, so the higher up you get, the more problematic that you have. Um, 
And for me, the, the ones and twos, those are, those are great. Once you get to three, instead of thinking, ah, this is gonna go smoothly, plan for it to be a disaster and have your other tools kind of sequenced out and ready. Because if you do that, it won't be a lot of pressure to get to them at that time. Um, so however you wanna do your airway assessment, some of them you're gonna know, but if you have the opportunity while the patient's conscious to have them open their mouth, that would be a, a helpful, yeah, get the other stuff out because I wanna make sure this is available. Um, this is for discussion break. So <laughs> innovations, we talk about nasotracheal innovations. We, we can't do that because they don't have faces. Um, but if you're ever doing a nasal tracheal innovation, uh, there's a couple nuances to that. Uh, ideally, the tube is a bit smaller because otherwise it doesn't fit. Um, you want to start out with your bevel uh, more lateral, dependent, well, depending on the near that you're going to. That one involves kind of a three-part rotation because you want your bevel to be out and then up and then to the side again. Um, when you're doing that, you're having the person kind of sit forward, you're placing it below the um, inferior turbinate, and you're sliding it back. It's not comfortable, nobody likes it. Um, this is kind of your, you don't have a neck, you definitely need an airway, you're still with me and can talk about this, and I don't really think we have a better option by doing heads. Um, a lot of times this is gonna be a, our innovation with you guys, ideally with a fiber optic, um, but if not, can be done blind. Um, and it's all about patience and timing, just like everything else that you do. So it's get the tube back, rotate it, and that, this is where the metal note for me is, I try to make my line on the tube, pay attention to where your, your bevel was, because you can't see it anymore. You want bevel up when you get to the back so that it'll slide down, and then when you get closer to the open birds, you want to turn it again once you've seen the tube go down the back of their throat or when you know that you're about that far based on distance. The trick to getting it in blind is dumb luck and timing it with inspiration. So making sure that they're timing it with an inspiration in, so take a big breath in, that's when you advance your tube. Um, you'll know if it goes in because they'll start to gag choke. Um, and that's gonna be them having that, that vocal cord spasm when that passes through there. Uh, ideally, you don't get to do any of those in the field. Um, but there have been worse days. Do you typically have any NG tubes, like specific NG tubes, uh, or like, or sorry, um, and, or for ET yeah. tubes? Sorry, no ones that because there are specific ones that we use for our procedures. You know, like would we do it like before, like a big head and neck case, mm -hmm. or do you just use a regular ET tube that you have there? Like, we do not have the extended ones in West End. We've procured those over the last five years. Okay, so we do not. Okay. So if we're thinking about this, generally you've been invited to the party and we're stalling time until you can get there unless we run out of time. They're always a good time. Uh, so that's our needs of tracheal innovation. Uh, this is what we just talked about. This is the same innovation view. Uh, we talk about ventilation. When we're doing the needle crikes, you're, you can oxygenate the person with that. With a needle crike, and we're talking about a 14 gauge, you cannot ventilate a person through that. So that, that's a common question, concern, misinterpretation that comes up a lot is, well, I got the needle crack, we're gonna ventilate them. No, you can oxygenate them, but you're not gonna ventilate them. Um, will it buy them time? Yes. Does it buy them limited time? No. But do I want you there as soon as possible? For sure. Um, there are a handful of different ways to oxidate once you have a needle crack set up. Uh, a BVM would not be my first choice of doing that. So a jet ventilation is the thing that should come to mind. The uh, next question that comes up is, does anybody know how to actually connect that and do it? Raise your hands if anybody knows how to actually connect it. Yeah. So it's all makeshift stuff, right? Number three, what? The jet ventilation? Yeah. Or do you like the syringe and everything? Yeah. yeah. So in the field, you can set it up with your 14 gauge you can use a size three ET tube, which will fit into the hub of a three ML syringe, and you can connect the two, um, and you can connect your action tube to that and let it go. Or you can leave the 14 gauge in, take it, what you always have, which is an NG tube. You can tape and fold off one of them, or you can just jam the, e the, the nasal cannula into the 14 gauge. And to get the flow, you just pinch off the other mirror, um, and you turn the flow up to max. Um, that is probably the most efficient, effective way to do it with supplies that you have in front of you all the time. And once it's in, your hand holds it in place. Nothing else, just your hand. Okay. 
and never let go of it. Okay, that's the biggest thing. Because the second you let go of it, it's just gonna fall out. Uh, surgical break, we're gonna work on that. For today, we're gonna use 11 blades because I have a crap ton of those and I have uh, four 10 blades. Um, in reality, you're gonna use the knife that you have available to you. Um, where you can use the size ET tube you have available. Today, we're gonna to talk about using fours. I think I have a couple of sixes. Um, four by fours and then you finger your hand. That's, that's what you need to do this. Uh, you can get a bunch of additional things, um, but this is the, the bare, this is what you need. Uh, a pair of scissors would be great too, because once you get all set, you're gonna to wanna to make that tube a hell of a lot shorter to be able to secure it, um, because you're taking out this much distance from the lower bearings. Um, so we're gonna come, go down to the lab here next. Uh, we're gonna talk about where we're gonna make our incisions, we're gonna talk about that on the takes, um, and then we're gonna go and proceed with the lab. Uh, wanna ask any questions that you guys have? So I just have one comment. There's a lot of ED docs that we would come across and you know EMS who do not understand what a laryngectomy stoma is. So when somebody gets a total laryngectomy, you're literally connecting their trachea to the front and there's no connection through the oral cavity. So people will go, oh, we're trying to intubate them. It's going into a blind pouch or always going into the stomach. And it, I don't know if you can pull up a picture of what a laryngectomy stoma looks like, or I can just kind of show on your one anatomy picture, like that first one. This one's specifically showing, so what we've done is connected like the trachea directly through. So that whole, your larynx is gone and it's connected to the front. And sometimes, you know, they'll have a button over it because they have a TEP in place. So what the TEP does is they press on the button, the air doesn't go out this way, it goes through here, and then they're able to generate voice. So you see a little piece of plastic back there, you know, that's just, you know, so they're able to speak and it's a, you know, a one-way vowel. So you can intubate just directly in there. It should be super easy. It's gonna be wide. You're gonna see tracheal rings there. And there's usually, they have like a plastic tube that comes out easily. And you can look and it's not trying to close on you. You can literally see tracheal rings and you can, it's the easiest intubation you can do. And it doesn't typically swell up, you know, when they're having other issues, but that's just something that we've run into a couple of times where they, you know, we walk into the ED, not our ED, of course, that's, we're not good, other EDs, but they have no idea what's going on here. And they're like, well, we tried to intubate from above and it's like, they're calling an acute airway and all that stuff. You can't, because there is no connection other than if they have a TEP, this little spot, and you don't want to rip through that because it's going to cause all kinds of problems. So just wanted to, to make that point. It's like if you see a big hole yeah, which is right like, over the sternal notch. Yeah, is there that's a like the laryngectomy. Yeah. So it's usually like you see the sternal notch right there. That you can actually see the TEP in place there. So that little piece of plastic that's back there is the TEP. And you should be able to take your finger and you can go like this, you know, and reach around because they, they, they're usually pretty big. So just wanted to make that point. You cool. made a comment about like taking off the plastic. It always was do take off it. Not the TEP, but the the Blomsinger tube. Can you just look at Blomsinger tube or laryngectomy tube? Comments down, Blomsinger. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> just put a laryngectomy tube. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So that's what it looks like. like they're, yeah, they're, it's soft. Yeah. You know, and they they pull right out. And like you don't have to worry about the trach site. You know, a lot of times it's a fresh trach or something, it'll close up really fast on you. These won't. So. So you take this out from the Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's what the that's what the uh, the button piece on the front of it looks like. So what size tube do you uh, suggest going into that? You can probably, probably, probably fit in the seven or an eight, really. I mean that's so big. Right. I mean you're you're already past the you know the typical shortest or you know um, narrowest, part the narrowest part of the airway, so the ten. Yeah. So whatever whatever so works, ten. whatever you can fit in there. Yeah. All right, anybody needs a bathroom break? We'll meet you out in the lab in five to ten minutes. So this is our pig pluck lab, and what we're working with is a pig pluck that goes from the tongue to the diaphragm. Uh, inside our magic bag here are going to be the lungs and the heart. Uh, should be two and one at that ratio. Uh, we're going to have sometimes have issues with the trachea on these pigs because of the way they're processed. Sometimes the trachea will have a rip in it, like we have right here. Um, so that wouldn't seal really well. So intentionally, we're gonna show what it looks like to do a right main stem, and then we'll back it out. Although in this one, we probably won't be able to insufflate the lungs very well. Because of the tear in the trachea, we would actually need the balloon up higher than the tear. 
Uh, first, what we're going to go through, and we've already looked at anatomy in our previous course that you've watched, is we're not going to use a blade because there's no mouth to have to manipulate. So in order for our innovation to work, we're going to come up to this side of the pig and we're going to look this direction. We're going to just use our hand to get our view. And so when we lift up, we should be able to see our airway right there. And we don't need a blade because, again, we're not manipulating an airway. But this is the base of the tongue where my thumb is. And here's our airway here with our vocal cords noted just below. I'll try to overextend that so that you can see. We're going to advance our tube in just like we normally would. Today we're not using stylets and it's more of a cost saving measure because, well, we don't need to right now. And normally you would advance to about here because you just want your balloon to disappear uh, when you're at this level. We don't really need it a whole lot farther, um, but for the sake of example, we're going to bury this sucker down because as we pointed out, we've got that hole in the trachea. So I'm going to inappropriately bury this way down. We're going to over inflate the cuff because we want to try to get a seal. And for the demonstration purposes, we're going to add peep and we're going to add a ridiculous amount of peep because we really want these lungs to inflate and we need to remember that these pigs have been dead for quite some time. We're going to over ventilate them and we're going to try to get them to inflate. And by using too much peep, it'll do it real fast. Um, I'm going to go a little slower now so we can see that the lungs are inflated. And one of the things that we'll notice is these lungs have holes in them that were intentionally put there. So the other thing that we can do in this lab, and as we're doing this, we can look at that potential space that shouldn't exist between the chest wall and the lungs that right now is preventing our lungs from fully inflating. And what we can do is we can introduce our needle decompression between the second and third rib space in the midclavicular line. We can put that through. Once we put that through, ideally not hitting the lung, advance our catheter in, and in real life, you're gonna be somewhere here because you had that potential space that's gonna prevent you from hitting the lung. And that should allow our lungs to fill up more of this space, and we should have an air leak out here where we put that in. Where you wouldn't have an air leak is if you accidentally buried it into the lung itself. It wouldn't work very well, and you really nearly fix the patient. What you'll notice on a live patient is they'll typically take a big breath and go, oh, I can breathe again. Um, it's not a permanent solution. As you can see, it doesn't fully inflate, but it's doing a lot better than it was before. Uh, after this part, we'll take a cut and we'll go to our next step in our course. So for our next part, what we're going to talk about is doing a needle crank. And so we went over our anatomy in the, in the classroom just a little bit ago. And so we're going to palpate up until we can find our cricoid cartilage. Again, this one's got a damaged trachea. So we're going to assume when we do the lab that our area that we're working with is here and that this represents the neck and that the chin is somewhere up here. So if we start at the sternal notch and we palpate up, the first lump that we run into should be the cricoid cartilage. And then the divot just beyond that should be the hole that we're looking for. And so I missed it because it was here. This is our divot that we're looking for, for our cricothyroid membrane. And then this is our thyroid cartilage. I'm gonna do this backwards for you only because Craig is filming on that side. But normally as a right-handed person, I'd wanna stand on the right-hand side of the patient to make my life easier. Um, the reason I would do that is because right now I'm kind of stuck doing all of this delicate work with my non-dominant hand. Alternatively, and, and that's how it should be done if you're on the other side of the patient. Alternatively, I can stabilize from below, but then I'm gonna be cutting and poking towards my hand which is really not the best laid plan. So we're gonna stabilize now that we've found our landmark right here. I usually use my finger to make a mark on the skin. Can you pour a little bit of water in here? Sure. Uh, for this example, we're gonna put just a little bit of water into this tube. What I usually have people do, take a flush syringe, and after you've broken the skin, attach your flush syringe to the top. The idea is to have water in here and the needle bevel into the skin. Once we've got ourselves here, and I'm gonna stabilize below just cause I don't think it's gonna work otherwise. Once we get where we're supposed to get, angling at a 45 degree angle down towards the chest, once we get into that potential space with air, which should be a little bit of a pop, we should get some air leak, which doesn't always happen in these pigs because again, they're not moving air and sometimes they have structures that are collapsed. But what you would expect to see in a human that you're saving is air bubbles coming out as this fluid leaks into the trachea. The question we get a lot is, is that fluid gonna cause us any problems? If you're doing this, that amount of fluid is not gonna cause you any problems. Uh, once we're in our potential space, we're gonna advance our needle down. And this is where we would do our jet ventilation from. 
you can't ever take your hands off this. There's nothing to secure it. There's no good way to tape it in. There's no good way to tie it in. So your hands on this and you doing jet ventilation is gonna allow you to oxygenate the patient but not ventilate the patient until you can get to your destination where you're going. That's typically gonna buy you somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes of time, depending on which article you're gonna reference. Um, but again, this is a heroic measure and this is a salvage maneuver. This is not a definitive save. So this gets you to where you're going so that you can move forward to a surgical airway. Uh, this will not change your end tidal CO2 because again, we're oxygenating, not ventilating. So monitoring your end tidal CO2 to see if this is in the right place will lead you astray. This is more of a pulse ox type of a monitor. So we're gonna take this out. So now we're talking about our surgical crike. So not to be confused with a surgical trach, which we would not do in the field or in the ER without ENT at bedside saying, yes, everything else has failed. So the reason we do surgical crikes and not surgical trachs comes up a lot because your trachea is a lot longer. Um, it'd be like trying to stab a spaghetti noodle hanging in the air from a clamp above that was cooked with, with an 18 gauge needle. It's incredibly hard, if not impossible, to put it into the middle of the noodle where you want. This just doesn't have the structure to support it. So again, we're gonna palpate up from the sternal notch. We're gonna palpate our lowest landmark, which is gonna be our cricoid cartilage. We're gonna find that divot right above, which is gonna be our thyroid cartilage. And this puts us into our cricothyroid membrane. I'm gonna use an 11 blade because this is a pig pluck, but in real life, you're gonna use the sharpest object you have that resembles a scalpel. Um, ideally, this is an 11 blade, it looks like an X-Acto knife. This is intended for a stab incision, not what we're doing. But for the scenario we have, this is what we're gonna to use today for safety. Um, in real life, you would ideally use a 15 or a 10 blade, which is a curved blade intending for slicing, not stabbing. And it prevents you from going through to structures behind where you're intending to be. So we're gonna use this scalpel different from what it's intended, but I just wanna make sure we acknowledge that. So again, we find our landmarks. I like it to be between my thumb and my finger, so I know where I'm making my cut. We're gonna make a vertical incision. I prefer to go away from my hand because I don't like trying to do stitches on myself at the end of my call. And we're gonna make a vertical incision. This is not meant to be pretty. This is always bloody and oozy. You're generally doing this on a patient with poor anatomy and they're not there to complain about it at the time. And the plastic surgeons can make it look better later after you save their life. So when we're making our vertical incision, we do that because if we're off and make a, a horizontal incision and we're off in the wrong level, we can't extend it and we have to make a new cut and create a new issue. So by extending this cut up, we can get down until we can see our cartilage that we're looking for. Then we can cut, and ideally you're holding here, right? But we're gonna cut across our cricothyroid membrane. I'm gonna do this as a stab incision because I'm not gonna cut my finger during this. And you're gonna cut this way and this way. The reason we don't use an 11 blade is because in order to get down where I am, you could go through the back of the trachea and cut the esophagus or get into vascular structures. So that's why we typically use a 10 blade or a 15 blade. You can see that we're into trachea here because we've got the right color. Uh, you're gonna see a tracheal ring if you go to feel. And at this point in time, I like to close my knife, use the back end of the knife to make my hole a little bit bigger twisting, which sounds awful, but you'll feel it go. That makes your hole big enough that you can stick your pinky finger in it and bend it down. So what my pinky finger is, is doing this. So I'm reaching in and bending down. I'm only letting go to show you that. What I would typically do is I would reach in with my hand that I'd just done the procedure with, bend my finger down so that I know I'm going the right direction, and that's gonna dilate my hole for me. Most of us have index fingers too big for this to work, and so that's why I start with my pinky. Uh, totally up to you. You're then going to take your tube, you're going to place it into the, the hole that you just dilated, and in this pig, because we have a disruption of the trachea that's cut below me, it's going to be challenging, but it'll go. And you're just going to push it in until the tube has the balloon disappear, at which point you're going to inflate. Uh, we're not concerned about being too high on this, we are concerned about being too low and ending up with a right main stem innovation. You're going to inflate your cuff, And as long as you can't see your balloon popping out of the hole, you're going to keep your hand stabilized. Your partner is going to help you bag. That really concludes our surgical procedure. Uh, the ingredients that we needed for it was a pig pluck, a chicken thigh, and a block of wood with some pins. Uh, the rest of the sharps you guys should have laying around the house. And uh, 
I hope you thought this was worthwhile. And if you guys want to do another one again, you know how to contact me.